All right, guys, I'll go ahead and get started because you're the troopers who have stayed the whole morning. Um, and it is, there's got to be something fun to do out there even with the slush. Uh, we're going to do abnormal thyroid function tests. We'll talk about true thyroid dysfunction and some pointers for treating. And the last half of the talk will be what I call like funky thyroid function tests, things that don't make sense. Um, that's where we have to pull out our pledge to do no harm and figure out what's really going on before we treat. So key players, meaning what are the things that we can test in thyroid dysfunction or approach to thyroid dysfunction? So I don't want to induce too much PTSD talking about feedback loops, but the few things we do test are shown here. The anterior pituitary, if you recall, is where TSH is produced, and that thyroid stimulating hormone then goes to the thyroid to um, cause the thyroid to produce thyroid hormones, both T3 and T4. So T4 is mainly what your thyroid gland makes. About 90% of what comes out of the thyroid is thyroxine or T4. It's just thyroid hormone with four iodine atoms attached. About 10%, maybe 20% of what we make is the more active form, T3, which is just thyroid hormone with three iodine atoms attached. How much of this is bound to th TBG or thyroid binding globulin in the circulation? Uh, virtually all of it. So over 99% of thyroid hormone needs its carrier protein. It can't just float around to the blood. The reason that's important is so many abnormalities in thyroid function tests are not due to people abnormalities, it's due to TBG abnormalities, we'll get to that. And then the other thing to remember is the 1%, the 1% of thyroid hormone that's free, that's your biologically active form of thyroid hormone. That's what actually traverses cell membranes, traverses the nucleus, and has the cellular actions of thyroid hormone. And T3 is the, quote, bioactive form. All of us are using TSH as a screen for primary thyroid dysfunction, and we should, and this is why. It is absolutely the most sensitive indicator of primary thyroid disease, and this graph just helps us recognize that. There's a so-called negative log linear relationship between T4 and TSH. All that means is on that x-axis, when T4 shifts a little bit, a little bit lower or a little bit higher, even within the, quote, normal reference range, the pituitary notices and very quickly shifts the TSH in the opposite direction up to 50-fold more than that T4 shift. So that's pretty powerful, and that's the reason why it's such a sensitive indicator of thyroid disease, even before the actual thyroid levels are out of the normal range. Therefore, we say that measuring thyroid hormones, T4 and T3, is not routinely necessary. We don't really recommend it for general screening. I definitely don't recommend it if there's a low probability of disease. Your patient who you're screening for fatigue and weight gain, just get a TSH. Um, and people who are treated with thyroid hormone, this is important. You know, a lot of people say, you've just been checking my TSH all these years. Could you just do a full thyroid panel? You certainly can, but it's a high likelihood that you may find a high free T4 if you do that. When people have just taken their medication, particularly if they're on high replacement doses, that T4 will show up outside the normal range. So why I recommend not routinely checking thyroid hormones are because many factors, like the ones I just mentioned, can cause very mild abnormalities of T4 or T3 without causing actual disease or dysfunction. Um, and then you'll unfortunately be stuck with a lab clinical conundrum, which is a normal TSH, abnormal thyroid hormones, and a normal appearing patient who's now upset because there's a low or a high beside one of his or her labs. And it takes a lot of time to explain that. Obviously, we do need to measure thyroid hormones in some situations, um, and these are the ones that I think are probably the most important. If you have a patient who has suspected or known central or secondary hypothyroidism, 95% of thyroid disease or hypothyroidism is primary, but anywhere from 3 to 5% can be secondary. That means the gland has nothing wrong with it. There's a problem with the signal from the pituitary gland. So these are folks who have had maybe whole brain radiation in the past and come in um, to you now with hypothyroid symptoms. People who may have another pituitary deficiency, like adrenal insufficiency, people who had a pituitary tumor resected. So if you're going to screen them for thyroid disease, you probably ought to do a whole panel because their TSH is always going to be low, um, no matter what their thyroid status is. So you need to rely on the T4. If you have a high suspicion for overt, rip-roaring hypothyroidism, like one of the patients mentioned in the previous lecture, and you think your TSH is going to be you know, 15 or 20, you may want to check the T4 at the same time, because if it's low, you have overt, not subclinical disease, and that generally is a stronger indicator for treatment. And then if you have a recent change in thyroid status, um, remember the TSH has a half-life about a week, so it takes about four or five half-lives to get a steady TSH, but in reality it can take as much as six to eight weeks. So if you have a recent thyroid hormone start, 
For example, in an elderly patient who's a little bit frail, TSH of 35, you think he or she is going to need at least 75 or 100 micrograms, but you don't feel comfortable jump-starting them at that dose, which I think is very appropriate. We don't want to increase myocardial oxygen demand in some folks that quickly. So you may start 25 micrograms. Certainly you can wait six to eight weeks and then move them to 50, but boy, that takes a while. So you can three or four weeks from now check TSH. It'll be coming down. It won't be completely normalized, but the T4, if it's in the normal range or high normal range, you know you're probably going to get to goal. And those are just some other reasons that you may want to check earlier. This is something I say often to residents, medical students, our fellows even. They're so hung up on these assays being truth. And those of us who have been in clinical medicine know there's lots of issues with lab measurements. This is really true for hormones. There are limitations to every test we do in the endocrine world, even thyroid hormones, um, that are unrelated to physiologic or pathologic changes in the patient. Uh, remember, when we're measuring free hormone levels, we are measuring like nanograms per deciliter worth of, of hormone. It's a little bit of hormone. We now have fourth generation assays, but we're still not perfect at measuring it. I listed some newer examples, just because maybe you haven't heard about these. Um, interfering antibodies are not at all common, so don't put it at the top of your differential, but folks have really bizarrely high TSHs and are probably euthyroid. A lot of these folks are people who have worked in lab environments. They're called human anti-mouse antibodies. Um, I've seen four or five cases now in the last couple of years, so they're out there. Biotin, we just had a talk on hair. So how many people have had patients who are coming in with biotin samples on their medication list? I mean, I don't know where it's coming from, but somebody's telling them to take biotin. Um, and we're not talking normal amounts of biotin, like a couple of hundred micrograms. People are on 5,000 micrograms a day. Generally, it's a water-soluble vitamin, so I can't say there's something wrong with doing that. The problem is a lot of our TSH and T4 assays um, are interfered with by high doses of biotin. Um, so I've had a lot of folks recently have had very bizarre TSH and T4 values I can't explain. Biotin's not on their list because I forgot to ask about over-the-counters and herbals, and then I finally ask about it. We stop the biotin, and within four days, the labs normalize. So there are some endocrine labs, including the one in Denver, that are now putting signs over their lab. You know, please tell us if you are taking biotin. That might be a little extreme, but at least keep it on your radar for folks who have tests you can't explain. You may want to ask. So I'll spend a few more slides on just antibodies, and then we'll get to the actual um, pathologic and physiologic changes. Thyroid antibodies, these are being measured um, with increasing use, at least from what I can tell. So let's just talk about the varieties of antibodies. There's TPO, or thyroid peroxidase antibodies. What I'm showing you here is a cross-section of a normal thyroid. So remember, the thyroid has these workhorses called follicles in them. The pink stuff is thyroglobulin. The little cells around the thyroglobulin are your follicular thyroid cells. That's where thyroid hormone is made. Thyroid peroxidase is just an enzyme. It's an enzyme that helps catalyze all that production of thyroid hormone. So to make thyroid hormone, you just stick iodine atoms onto thyroglobulin. That's what that enzyme does. So we, have, we can make antibodies against that. <coughs> you can make antibodies against thyroglobulin, which is kind of a substrate upon which thyroid hormone is made. And then you've got an entirely different kind of antibody. TSIs and TSH receptor antibodies are generally stimulatory antibodies that bind to the thyroid cells themselves, okay? Those are just to remember the names, TPOs, thyroglobulins, and those two down there are the stimulatory antibodies. Thing to remember is there's a very high background prevalence, particularly of TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies. So just resist the urge to routinely check these, because you'll find them in up to 25% of some populations. This is NHANES data um, that's now over 10 years old. Um, this is in women and men. It's just to show you that as you get older, um, up to 20% of our folks can have high TPO antibodies if you check. So why would you check? Um, there are potential reasons to check thyroid antibodies. TPO antibodies actually can help predict eventual hypothyroidism in patients at risk. So your patients may be throwing around the term Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I think I have Hashimoto's. You know, that's a pathologic term. It just refers to what you see under the microscope in folks who have antibody-mediated destruction of their thyroid gland. But we throw it around as clinicians. The radiologists are using it a lot. Um, so if you happen to have a patient with a borderline high TSA to 6, 7, 8, maybe they have a goiter, maybe they have a strong family history, maybe they're going to start one of these high-risk meds, amiodarone, lithium, interferon, can all cause thyroid dysfunction. Someone with very high TPO antibodies is at higher risk for progressing. 
Now, if their TFTs are otherwise normal, you don't treat them at the time. So you can argue, what's the point of checking the antibodies? I'll just check their TSH more often. That's perfectly reasonable. But this is one situation where you could check the TPOs. Um, monitoring thyroid cancer patients is the only time that I recommend checking thyroglobulin antibodies. It is not predictive of overt thyroid dysfunction in the future like TPO antibodies are. Um, thyroglobulin is a hormone that we, or a protein that we use as a cancer marker when we treat thyroid cancer patients. Because if you have no thyroid left, you should have no thyroglobulin floating around. And thyroglobulin antibodies just help us decide if we can trust that thyroglobulin number or not. So in my opinion, I don't really think thyroglobulin antibody checking has any role in just the care of primary patients. And then finally, there is utility, I think, for TSI and TSH receptor antibodies. So if you have a patient who comes in, young woman, hyperthyroid, maybe not the most rip-roaring goiter in the world or proptosis, you think she might have Graves, you know, certainly you could send her for a radioiodine uptake and scan, but maybe she's breastfeeding or maybe she has some other contraindication to getting a radioiodine uptake and scan. If this person has positive TSI, they have Graves. Um, TSI is not one of those things that hangs out in a large proportion of the population. So thyroid stimulating antimiglobin or TSH receptor antibodies, if it's positive in a hyperthyroid patient, um, you pretty much know that they have autoimmune hyperthyroidism. Don't worry about fetal hyperthyroidism. I think that's more for the endocrinology world. This bottom rectangle, though, I do want to emphasize. Um, if people have positive antibodies but nothing else abnormal, meaning their TSH is normal, we, do not necessarily, we don't need to treat those people. Okay? And there, we do sometimes get pushback from patients who have read various things. The second caveat is also true, particularly for TPO and thyroglobulins. We don't follow antibody trends in patients. So if you're going to treat a patient with levothyroxine, just follow their TSH like you normally do. The TPO antibodies often won't go away. They'll fluctuate up and down. The one time that I do repeat antibodies is in hyperthyroidism. If I have a Graves patient I've been treating for a couple of years, I'm trying to see if she or he will stay in remission. Um, before you take off the drug, if their antibodies have gone down significantly, they have a higher risk or higher predictive value for staying in remission. So that's not the most common use, but that is one possibility. In general, though, if you're checking these once, just check it for that first indication I mentioned. All right, so we'll spend the next portion of the talk just talking about overt and subclinical primary thyroid dysfunction, meaning real thyroid disease. So a simple rule of thumb, which I think you already know, is if the TSH and the T4 are abnormal, and they're abnormal in the opposite direction, you probably have a real thyroid problem. If the TSH alone is abnormal, you probably have subclinical thyroid disease, statistically speaking. There are some other things that can make the TSH funny, which we'll talk about in the third and final portion of the talk. So I'll have this little table up there for every time we go through a new topic to remind us what overt hypothyroidism is. These are the top causes. So in this country, it's almost always autoimmune. Um, Hashimoto's is the clinical pathologic term for it. It's just probably 95% of why our patients have hypothyroidism, unless, of course, they had a thyroidectomy or had radioiodine to treat Graves or nodular goiter. Those are the top two. We don't have iodine deficiency much in our country as a cause of hypothyroidism. I will say worldwide, it's still the number one cause of hypothyroidism in some parts of the world. Sadly, it's the number one cause of mental retardation in some parts of the world. You know, it's hard to get iodine when you don't live near the sea, and if you're not supplemented with iodine salt, that can be an issue. Uh, people in these specialties routinely do check thyroid, uh, thyroid hormones because amiodarone is like the endocrinologist's nightmare. It can do anything to the thyroid, but 20% of folks do get hypothyroidism if they take it. Same for lithium. Interferon, I'm not seeing as much of this, maybe because there are other good hep C treatments. Um, and then radiation treatment to the head or neck definitely causes hypothyroidism in a good portion of patients, and it's years later. It's a delayed effect. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen many folks with melanoma and so forth on these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, but thankfully folks are living a long time, so they're getting other diseases, and they can get uh, about 40 to 50 percent of folks on those drugs in the onc world can get thyroid dysfunction. So they're routinely being screened by their specialists, but just to put it out there. So if you're treating, we generally recommend treating with levothyroxine and adjusting based on the TSH every 6 to 12 weeks. And I don't think that's anything new. So this term subclinical hypothyroidism is, is really painful because um, the term doesn't mean that much. It doesn't re re reflect the clinical status of your patient. Um, it's probably better to say mild hypothyroidism. The patient may be symptomatic, they may not. 
has the exact same causes as overt hypothyroidism. That second bullet is what I want you to remember. Um, it can be normal or physiologic to have a slightly high TSH outside the reference range in, quote, advanced age. So you may ask, what's advanced age? But with each decade after 50 or so, our TSH does go up a little bit. Um, if you are someone who is always destined to have a set point TSH of 1, maybe your, quote, new TSH will be a 3 by the time you're in your 70s or 80s. Um, but it can be normal for an octogenarian to have a TSH of 4, 5, or even 6. What's been real problematic, I don't know about you guys, but our lab keeps making the TSH range narrower and narrower and narrower. You can see it's now 0.6 to 3.3. So like all my patients' THs are highlighted in yellow on their patient portal now, whereas before they used to at least kind of sneak in a normal range. So at some point we will be getting more age-specific TSH ranges because it is important to keep some people below 2.5, young women, people who are trying to get pregnant, but definitely not important to keep an 85-year-old healthy person at a TSH of 3 if they're not there. Um, and we'll talk about other causes of high TSHs. So we do recommend for subclinical folks, um, generally considering treatment of TSHs over 10, even if the T4 hasn't fallen out of range yet. And you say, why? I feel fine. I do have folks with TSHs of 12 who say, I feel fine. Why do you want to treat me? And I say, well, we have pretty good evidence that cardiovascular parameters, I'm not going to say outcomes, but parameters like lipids will improve, LDL will go down by about 10%. Um, things that cardiologists like to test, like um, distensibility of the heart, blood vessels. It's very consistent in studies. How much that translates into something clinically meaningful for your patient, that I can't attest to, but that's the recommendation. And most of these folks are going to get overt disease in the next couple of years. Not all, but most. Between 4 and 10 is where we're really not sure what to do. And different guidelines have different um, suggestions. I've just put up one algorithm there. This is, albeit, um, slightly aggressive. It comes from David Cooper and Dr. Biondi. David Cooper is a thyroid person at Hopkins. So if you have subclinical hypothyroidism and the TSH is high but it's not yet above 10, the suggestion is if you have a high background cardiovascular risk, things like diastolic dysfunction and hypertension, or if you have some sort of symptoms, you have a goiter. If you're trying to get pregnant, that's the one area I will say absolutely treat those people. That's important. Um, they recommend considering levothyroxine replacement. However, if your TSH is between 4 and 10 and you're otherwise healthy, no goiter, no antibodies, not going to get pregnant, no symptoms, the recommendation is don't treat and you just recheck. Now, it's hard for a lot of us who see a TSH of 8 to just say, all right, come back, your TSH is 8, no big deal. But it's probably okay in some people. Um, the risk, in my mind, of treating mild degrees of thyroid dysfunction is that you're going to overtreat them. You know, 20% of people in this country on levothyroxine are overtreated. And as of a few months ago, levothyroxine was the number one prescription written in this country um, for chronic. I'm not talking about like pain drugs, antibiotics, and so forth. But that's kind of, to me, that's kind of scary. I don't think we're um, causing vastly improved quality of life in all these people. And I think there's a real risk for iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. So just be careful. The closer that TSH to normal when you treat, the narrower that therapeutic index. So how many of you have seen this? A patient who has so-called refractory hypothyroidism, you've put them on a good dose, their TSH might respond, but it never seems to be quite normal. You know, it maybe gets to 5, 6. Do you have these folks who will tell you they're taking their medication? Maybe you have more adherent patients than I do, but I do have some folks who start to get in doses that don't seem reasonable. So what can be going on? Well, adherence is super common, as you know. Not everyone's going to take their medication. I do recommend using pill boxes. For people who aren't adherent, I really recommend telling patients that they can double up on their thyroid hormone. You have to be careful, because um, I've been burned. Tell them not to do this with other drugs. You know, if you forget your statin or you forget your sulfonylurea, don't double or triple up two or three days later. But you can do this with thyroid hormone. It's a cumulative effect. So, um, you know, if you forgot Mondays and Tuesdays, you can take three on Wednesday. It's actually fine. In uh, very, you know, extreme cases, there are reports of folks who are just dosed once weekly with their full weekly dose of levothyroxine. I don't recommend that. I think it's probably safer to do it daily. Um, but for the folks who are constantly traveling, who are missing one or two pills a week, well, that's the difference between someone who's taking 75 micrograms a day and someone who's really taking an average of 50 micrograms a day. So just let patients know they can do that. The things under absorption, iron, calcium, multivitamin, fiber, um, these apply to supplements, not things in regular food. So if you're taking high doses of iron or calcium, we recommend separating that by at least three hours from your thyroid hormone. So take it at lunch, take it at supper. 
Um, same thing for protein pump inhibitors, various GI diseases. Addition of estrogen. So any idea why taking estrogen might change your thyroid hormone? Yeah, excellent. Excellent. And so I've got two different things. I've got, well, it may affect your binding globulin, and that's exactly how it does it. And I have another comment, well, it'll change your levels, but it may not actually affect the patient's thyroid status. I'll say that one depends. So the first one is 100% true. When you take especially oral estrogen or stop taking oral estrogen, your thyroid binding globulin status changes. So if I start taking birth control pills, my liver will make more thyroid binding globulin, and I will bind up more thyroid hormone. If I have a normal thyroid, no big deal. My normal thyroid will almost very soon realize what's going on, just make a little more thyroid hormone to compensate, and everything's back to steady state. No big deal. However, in a patient who is athyrotic or has hypothyroidism, they can't do that autocompensation. So it's not a huge difference, but a, someone who's had thyroidectomy or is already on 100, 150 of levothyroxine, if they start a birth control pill, oftentimes you'll see that TSH bump into the four or five or six range where it used to be normal, and you just have to increase the dose by a little bit. Conversely, if they stop taking estrogen, if they go into menopause, if they stop their HRT, the TSH may all of a sudden be a 0.2, whereas it used to be normal. And all you have to do is reduce the dose a little bit. So it's just something to keep in mind when numbers change unexpectedly. I'm not going to mention the ones on the right column because they're really uncommon. Um, so there is a loading test that we can do in the office for folks who swear they're taking their medication and every time they come in their dose goes up. We just give them a very large dose, up to 1,000 micrograms of levothyroxine in the office and measure their T4 every two hours and it goes up nicely and the TSH will come down by about 40 or 50 percent and you know they can absorb it. So I've gotten those cases for referrals and I just send them back with a supervised administration. They usually do fine. It's not a common thing you need to do, just know that it's out there. All right, so switching gears to hyperthyroidism, you kind of have the opposite, low TSH, high T4. But I have an asterisk beside that. I write, sometimes the T4 can actually be normal in overt hyper hyperthyroidism. Well, how is that? Well, in certain diseases, particularly Graves' disease, your thyroid may be ramped up and that whole proportion of T4 to T3 goes out the window. You just start making a lot of T3, whereas the normal thyroid gland does not make much T3. So if you have someone who looks really symptomatic and their TSH is zero, and their T4 is still kind of in the normal range, you may want to check a T3 before labeling them subclinical hyperthyroidism. They probably have overt hyperthyroidism. It's just due to extra T3 production. So that's what that caveat is in there for. The top causes of hyperthyroidism in younger folks, it's Graves. Folks over 50 or 60, it's usually one or more nodules that are overactive. But I've seen everything in every age group. I've diagnosed 90-year-olds with Graves and young people with nodules, but that's just you know, a general epidemiologic breakdown. You can sometimes just see one toxic nodule. And then iodine load and susceptible glands. Has anyone ever seen this after a cath or a CAT scan? It does happen. We're sometimes consulted in the hospital. Folks who are susceptible to develop hyperthyroidism, maybe they have a you know, kind of a brewing nodule where the TSH has kind of been 0.8 and no one's really bothered about it because they didn't need to. If they, the next morning after a cath or another iodine load, get um, pretty impressive hyperthyroidism, it's often iodine-induced from the load. The rest of us who have normal glands, when we get a big iodine load, we have mechanisms. It's called the wolf checkoff effect. We have mechanisms to avoid incorporating all that iodine into thyroid hormone production. Okay, so just a rare but interesting case. Thyroiditis is pretty common. Um, it just means you're dumping thyroid hormone into the bloodstream. It usually resolves on its own. It's oftentimes painless and sometimes difficult to differentiate from graves because it's often young women who get thyroiditis. And then sometimes people take it without telling you. Um, the treatment for any time your thyroid gland is making too much thyroid hormone is threefold. You can give medications. These thionamide drugs have been around since the 1940s, methimazole and PTU, nothing new or exciting there. You can treat them with radioactive iodine, which has the side effect of potentially making them hypothyroid. Um, and in some cases, you'll need to do surgery. For thyroiditis, there's no reason to use thionamides because you're not making too much thyroid hormone. You're just dumping a bunch of preformed thyroid hormone into the bloodstream. So you just have to get the patient through the episode. And that might mean beta blockers. That might mean NSAIDs or steroids if you have a painful gland. Um, it's just symptomatic treatment. 
So if you've ever um, sent someone for a thyroid uptake and scan, these are just ways to differentiate in hyperthyroid patients. That's really the only reason to order a thyroid uptake and scan. Um, normal looks like A. Graves is more intense and has a high uptake. Typically, these folks are taking up more than 35% of iodine at 24 hours. And there are some pictures to show you nodules. And thyroiditis looks like nothing. Because remember, they're not taking up iodine and making thyroid hormone. They're just dumping thyroid hormone to the bloodstream. So an iodine uptake scan will look negative. This is how thyroiditis recovers. And this is kind of important because by the time patients come to you, they might actually be in the second or third phase. So if you are starting to dump thyroid hormone into the bloodstream because of pre-existing viral illness or just autoimmune tendencies, you will have a high T4, T3 with a low TSH. That makes sense. Then if the gland starts to rest, hibernate, recover. So then the T4 and T3 fall in the bloodstream, but the TSH has not yet had time to come up. That's when I get a lot of consults. You know, people say they have a woman who came in with palpitations, unexpected weight loss, et cetera, et cetera, and they come in and she has a low TSH, but now her T4 and T3 are also low. So then you have to say, when did these symptoms start? And if they started six weeks, 12 weeks ago, the woman's probably recovering thyroiditis, and all you have to do is recheck her TFTs a couple of weeks later. And that's what that third phase is. 80% of folks with thyroiditis just return to normal. Okay, so that is a very reasonable thing to do. You don't have to do an uptake and scan. Subclinical hyperthyroidism simply means the TSH is low. You've got a TSH of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.01, undetectable, but the T4 and T3 are fine. So the causes are the same. Oftentimes it's early graves or early functioning nodules. But this is the important point. It actually may be normal for some people to have a slightly low TSH that is lower than the reference range. This is kind of the flip side of what I said for the high TSH in elderly folks. Um, some African-American individuals, especially young, healthy African-American women, just have a TSH of 0.35 or 0.3, and that is their normal. Um, so again, this is kind of a failure of our reference range system to accommodate for different populations. But I see a lot of young, healthy African-American women with no family history, no goiter, no antibodies, nothing. And I tell them, sure, you could have really early disease, in which case I wouldn't treat you anyway but you may just have a normal variant. And so what about treating subclinical hyperthyroidism? This is a little bit stickier than treating subclinical hypo because the evidence base is even less. Um, it's recommended generally if the TSH gets below 0.1 um, per folks over 60 to avoid the threefold increased risk of AFib and the increased risk of osteoporosis or bone density related fractures to treat. And everyone else, it's kind of up to us whether we observe or treat. This is maybe a not so helpful algorithm because it's kind of busy, but it does tell us whom we should consider treatment versus not when you see these low TSHs. If you have an older person over the age of 60 or someone who has heart disease that may predispose them to a dysrhythmia, maybe it's a woman you're already treating for osteoporosis, basically anyone where that higher TSH can actually cause them harm. And if that TSH is under 0.1, I would still treat those people. You know, you can send them for an uptake and scan. You can decide how to treat them. That may be you or your consultant, but they probably ought to be treated. On the other end of the spectrum, if they're young, healthy, no symptoms, and a real mild TSH suppression of 0.1 to 0.4, you can evaluate it if you want, but you're not going to treat them anyway. So you can probably just tell them to watch that TSH initially, maybe at six months, and if it's stable, just check it yearly. Um, and let them, let, tell them to let you know if they get symptoms. In between, there's so many asterisks and caveats. Basically, when you have mild suppression in an older person or even severe suppression in a younger person, it's hard to know whether to treat. And that's just when you have to talk to the patient. If they have symptoms like anxiety, palpitations, et cetera, you may want to do a low dose, short trial of treatment. All right, so that's all I have to say about true thyroid dysfunction before we go into abnormal tests. Does anybody have questions about hyperhypothyroidism treatment? Question. What about using thyroid? That's okay. So the question is, what about using thyroid hormones with weight loss? Is, should we be giving people thyroid hormone to help lose weight? Um, the answer is no. We should not. So thyroid hormone and weight loss and weight. You know, when people are overtly hypothyroid, in general, in real studies, people can gain about 10 pounds. A lot of it's water weight. In real life, we see a lot more than that in my patients and in friends and family members of mine. And whether that's because they feel bad and they're exercising less or they're depressed and eating more, I don't know. But just, and so if you give thyroid hormone for 
weight loss. It doesn't help when you're just given 25 micrograms to get them into a one, two range, at least from what we know from studies. And then the, if you overtreat them to get them to lose weight, then you're causing all these other risks. So the general answer is I would not use thyroid hormone as a weight loss drug. Yes? Maybe related to some of the weight loss clinics in our area, they will do a whole bunch of thyroid tests. They'll find something wrong and put them on armor thyroid. Yes. So armor thyroid. Very good question. Um, and I do have a case about that. So let me hold that for a second. Don't let me forget it because it's just, we're just going to see more and more of folks like that. But the first point you make with the weight loss clinics, checking a whole panel of disease to find something abnormal, you'll find it. If you're going to check thyroid antibodies, the entire panel, and a thyroid ultrasound, if you want to throw that in there, half of us over 50, if we're female, have thyroid nodules. A good way to make a patient think you're a great doctor is to check a bunch of things because you'll find something abnormal. You're absolutely right. All right, so weird thyroid function tests to me are where the TSH and the T4 are abnormal, but they're going in the same direction. That's not supposed to happen. If there's a true thyroid problem, they're supposed to go in opposite directions. Or if the TSH is normal, and only the T4 is abnormal. That's not supposed to happen either, right? Because the TSH is the most sensitive indicator of disease. So when you see these patterns, kind of get out your up-to-dates, your reference tools, and figure out what's going on. I know you guys can't see this, or at least I can't see this, but the big point is please always think about drugs first when your thyroid function tests don't make sense, because they're the easiest things to pinpoint. Whether or not you can take them away is a different issue, but at least you can avoid treating somebody for thyroid disease. The third column is what I really want you to look at, drugs that cause abnormal thyroid function tests but don't actually affect thyroid function. Um, the big offenders, as someone here alluded to, I think was estrogen status. If you're taking estrogen or are pregnant, you're just going to have a high total T4 because of that thyroid binding globulin increase, but your TSH will be normal, your free T4 will be normal, so you can get a little confused. Um, and there are a lot of things that affect thyroid hormone binding, and I have a couple of cases to illustrate this. All right, so I think we have like a total of nine very short vignettes. I'll try to get through most of them. So case one is a 58-year-old gentleman admitted to the ICU with pneumonia, respiratory distress. He's intubated. He gets better with supportive care and antibiotics. is extubated. Family's concerned that he's not still himself, which is not that surprising after having been in the ICU. His TSH is checked along with a whole host of things to figure out what's going on. It's 0.05. Team is concerned maybe he's hyperthyroid. So they check the other labs. His T4 actually turns out to be a little low. T3 actually ends up being a little low. When you go to see him, his heart rate's good, his blood pressure's fine, he's ambulating, he's eating. He's not, again, quite himself for his family, but he looks okay otherwise. His exam's non-focal. Um, maybe he has a small thyroid. Maybe you just can't feel the thyroid. I don't know, but it's listed as a small thyroid. So just given this whole clinical picture, the concern that the team always has in this case is, does my patient have central hypothyroidism? That's what I get called a lot for. Um, should I get an MRI on this patient? Because you gave us electron thyroid last month, and you said low TSH and low T4 could be central hypothyroidism. So it could be, but the most common cause is probably something far more common. Does anyone have an idea what's going on? Yeah, sick thyroid syndrome. So that's the, ner that's the term I learned also. Uh, it's no longer being used, but it's essentially what this is. It's now called very blandly non-thyroidal illness, or NTI. Um, it used to be called sick thyroid syndrome. That got confusing because it sounded like the sick you, like the surgical ICU. So then it became, was the other one around, then, it became then it became euthyroid sick. Well, then it was euthyroid sick for a while. This has been in vogue, so I don't know what it'll be called next. This is such a silly term because it doesn't signify much, but that's what we use, non-thyroid illness. It refers to abnormal thyroid function tests in critically ill people without any thyroid problems. Maybe it's a protective thing. You know, maybe we're not supposed to be ramping up our metabolism when we're sick. Um, over half of hospitalized patients will have this pattern if you look if they're very sick patients. There are lots of reasons. You know, when you're sick, you have cytokines that are circulating. Um, you have inhibitors of deiodinase. So all that T3 that's supposed to be working actually gets turned into reverse T3 which I don't recommend that you measure, by the way. There's lots of issues with measuring reverse T3s, and our lab won't even measure it anymore. But that's part of what's happening. There's lots of reasons why you're, everything can just look low when you're sick. So it looks like central hypothyroidism, but it's transient. We usually tell folks just to recheck it a couple of weeks after recovery. Now, if you have a high suspicion that they have central disease, certainly you can evaluate with imaging and so forth. But most of the time, it's not a high suspicion. It was just something that was found. 
So case two, 66-year-old woman with long-standing hypothyroidism. She's been taking levothyroxine 112 micrograms daily for a number of years. Um, past medical history is listed there, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She had a cellar meningioma removed over 10 years ago with radiation. Um, she's overweight, but otherwise normal exam. TSH is 0.01 on a routine lab. So at that point, the dose is reduced to 100 micrograms, and she's seen every couple of weeks to months. Her TSH is not improving, and her dose is successively reduced until she's off of thyroid hormone. And then she comes to see you for evaluation of hyperthyroidism. Why is she all of a sudden having a TSH of 0.1? On an exam, she doesn't really look hyperthyroid. She's bradycardic. She has a blood pressure of 135 over 98 with that high diastolic pressure. She's puffy. I actually saw this lady. She looked like she had a you know, frog voice, just very thick, big tongue, um, and non-pitting edema. So she looks hypothyroid despite a TSH of 0.01. So what happened with this lady? Yeah, so she has not even, I will even just say central, a central problem. So a cellar meningioma, the cella is, the cella tercica is the place where the pituitary is housed. That's where her meningioma was. So she, I left out part of the history. Um, she actually has a history of documented secondary or central hypothyroidism. She had been followed by a stable primary care doctor for a long time who knew her, lost her insurance, ended up seeing a bunch of different urgent care. So it wasn't one doctor he kept reducing her dose. But she came in and told him she had hypothyroidism. And they checked her labs, and they did what they thought was appropriate. So you know, I was a little sneaky there. I left out some of the history. But just be really careful. Patients, you know, they're supposed to know their history, and they're supposed to tell you that. But they don't know what labs to check sometimes. How do, yes, sir. How do you adjust the dose? Excellent. There's that fourth bullet down there, management. How do we follow patients with secondary hypothyroidism? We just follow the T4. We can't really follow the TSH. I don't love it because, you know, I'm so used to the TSH as the barometer for how I'm doing because there's such a wide range of normal T4. But we generally keep people in the upper end of normal of their T4 or their free T4, and clinically as well. Is there any time that you use T3? Is there any time that you do T3 in these patients? So there are times, so everyone just wants to have that T3 discussion. Let's just do it. Okay, so T3. Um, so, you know, as those of you know who have been around maybe a little bit longer, you know, for a long time there was no levothyroxine or synthetic human hormone, human thyroid hormones. So armor thyroid, desiccated porcine thyroid, bovine thyroid. There's lots of ways to get thyroid hormone into a human being without making it in a lab. So there's nothing evil about armor or T3. However, since levothyroxine has been around, that's, you know, the exact opposite. It's the L isomer, essentially, of human thyroid hormone. So in my mind, it is more natural to give humans human thyroid hormone, which is what levothyroxine is. It's more predictable. It's easier to titrate. And so, um, but uh, with the natural movement, the internet movement, there's a lot of folks who have interest in going back on armor or adding synthetic T3 because it's the active form of thyroid hormone. My spiel to patients usually is, I prefer for your body to decide how much to deiodinate at the heart and the brain and the liver, et cetera. Because the heart and the bone are particularly susceptible to toxicities of thyroid hormone. I think it's better to decide how much you need at that site. Um, the gut needs more thyroid hormone, so you should deiodinate more. That being said, the person just kind of stares and said, all right, so what dose of armor are you going to start me on? So I succumb. It depends on the day of the week. Um, studies of T4, T3 versus T4 alone largely are negative. They don't show a big difference. They show a little bit more over-treatment and combined treatment patients. But you can find some smaller studies out there that show a little bit better in terms of questionnaires, quality of life. Sometimes three pounds weight differences you'll see in T4, T3 versus T4. There was a big article just published in our Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism this month that suggests another potential benefit to T3, but they're really soft endpoints and it's hard to measure. The biggest reason I don't prescribe it is because it really makes thyroid function tests very difficult to interpret and it's easy to over-treat. Um, but if you want to treat patients with it, you can. Just know you need to reply, rely solely on the TSH and not look at the T4, T3 because you'll get very confused. Cytomel is synthetic T3. If I use Cytomel, I don't use more than 5 micrograms. Um, even 25 micrograms is like a full-on replacement dose, but it spikes. It's not a nice steady state. So if someone's on 100 levothyroxine, I might reduce it to 75 or 88 and add 5 of Cytomel. I'm kind of conservative, though. I mean, you can find headache specialists and fibromyalgia specialists and all sorts of folks out there who'll just give massive amounts of T3, and that's kind of beyond you know, me or the scope of what I do. So there's just a list of the different things that can cause central hypothyroidism. 
clues are basically mass effect in women, and young women take menstruation abnormality seriously if they start having amenorrhea um, when they never used to before. That third bullet's important, I think, for anyone taking at least enteral medicine boards. It's still on there. If you think someone has secondary hypothyroidism, it's really never urgent to give them thyroid hormone. Um, you, can, you can go a while without your thyroid hormone. And if you happen to just want to see if they'll feel better with 50 of levothyroxine, the problem is if they have other pituitary deficits that are not treated, meaning central hypoadrenalism, they'll all of a sudden metabolize that last little bit of cortisol they have around. You can precipitate adrenal crisis. So this is definitely on the internal medicine boards. I can't vouch for other boards. But if you have secondary hypothyroidism, don't treat it without ruling out secondary hypoadrenalism first. Okay. All right, case three. 34-year-old woman who's depressed with fibromyalgia and does have hypothyroidism. Um, she's feeling more anxious and jittery in the last few months. I will say she definitely has primary hypothyroidism. Um, her doses of thyroid hormone have been increased a couple of times for, quote, low thyroid levels. But her T4 and free T4 are still low. And now her TSH all of a sudden is 0.03. Her pituitary's noticed the extra thyroid hormone. She looks hyperthyroid. She's tachycardic with a high systolic pressure, which is what hyperthyroidism does. Pressured speech, some tremors, warm, clammy skin. You repeat her labs, and in fact, her TSH is suppressed. Her free T4 is also a little bit low, which is perplexing, and her free T3 is high. So I think you guys knew I was going to do this case next. What is this patient being treated with? Yeah, she has some type of T3 in her treatment regimen, and I have seen this multiple times. So when you take, let me see if I have an explanation slide. Yeah, so here we go. So if you're going to be giving porcine thyroid or synthetic T4 or T3, um, you should never treat anyone with T3 alone. That is not physiologic replacement. Um, at low doses, when someone's appropriately replaced, so you're a mild hypothyroid patient who only needs 25 or 50 of levothyroxine, that person, if you switch over to a T4, T3 combo, they'll probably have a normal TSH, and the T4 will kind of be in the normal to mid-normal range if you check. But let's say you have a real athyrotic person, someone who's been doing great on 175 micrograms of levothyroxine. If you switch them over to an equivalent dose of T4, T3, they're going to be getting kind of a lot of T3, and they won't be getting proportionally as much T4. So when you measure T4 in these patients, they can look low. And that's what's confusing. So if you're doing T4, T3 therapy, it's, it seems like the T4 and T3 should both be normal, but that's not often what happens. Oftentimes, the measured T4 is low. So you can't go by the T4 in adjusting your treatment in these folks. That's what I'm trying to get at. The T3 can vary hugely. If you check it shortly after cytomel dosing, it's very high. If you check it right before they get their armor, it can be low. It can be normal. So my recommendation is if you are going to be using any kind of T3 regimen, in my mind, it's best to rely on the TSH plus, of course, your patient and their clinical symptoms. Okay. All right, so there's my summary from the first three cases we did. If you have a low TSH, but the T4 is also low, you have to think about non-thyroid illness. Well, that's not too hard. You go by clinical setting. You have to think about central hypothyroidism and over-treatment with a regimen that includes T3. Okay, next few cases will have a different pattern. 20-year-old female, an undergraduate with primary hypothyroidism that's been documented, who takes 75 of levothyroxine and does fine. She starts college with normal thyroid function tests. Since she's been in college, she's been seen by campus health, and her dose has been increased a couple of times for a high TSH. She's now on 125 a day. She's busy. She intermittently comes to her scheduled visits. And then a recent office visit, her TSH is still a little bit higher than you would like to see. It's 6.9. But her free T4 is actually doing quite well, in fact, too well. It's 1.8. It's too high. And so you call the pharmacy. He tells you, well, she doesn't really take her medications or pick it up as she's supposed to. She has less than 50% adherence. So why does she have this clinical picture? She did. She was good. She came and she took her medicine right before she saw you. So this is recent thyroid hormone compliance. I see this a lot. I don't know if I'm just scary or if people just really want to get their meds in before they see me. Um, but the TSH hasn't had time to equilibrate when the woman's only been taking her medication for three, four, five, six days before she sees you. And in fact, 125 is probably going to be too high a dose for this lady if she were to take it every day. 
So just really ask about compliance without trying to be accusatory. You know, I usually generalize it and say, you know, in my experience, a lot of folks who start a new job or start college have trouble taking their thyroid hormone. And if that's the case, just let me know so I won't accidentally increase your dose after I check your labs today. So we all have our own approach. All right, so here's amiodarone. A 74-year-old gentleman started on amiodarone appropriately for ventricular arrhythmia, normal thyroid screening test beforehand, and a month later, his TSH is high also. His free T4 is also high, but his free T3 is low. He feels fine. He's been tolerating amiodarone well otherwise. Um, and you don't really notice anything exciting on exam. He does have tremors, but you look back on the chart, he's had tremors forever. They're just mild baseline. So what did amiodarone do? So amiodarone can do a lot. So this is the only one I really want you to remember because this is something that does not require an endocrinology or any referral. So amiodarone has what we call a lab effect on the thyroid. This is not true thyroid dysfunction yet. Um, it affects in virtually, it occurs in virtually all patients, and it's due to the fact that amiodarone does reduce conversion of T4 to T3 in the periphery, okay, because that's what all our bodies do to get active thyroid hormone on board. So at least for the first few weeks of treatment, you get a high-looking T4 or free T4 because it's not being converted to T3. You get a low T3 or free T3, and the TSH notices, meaning the pituitary realizes what's going on and starts to increase the TSH just a little bit. So it's a very confusing picture. But most of the time, the TSH will just reset into normal range, and your chronic amiodarone patient who's not having any thyroid dysfunction has a normal TSH, sometimes a little high free T4 and sometimes a little high free T3. So that is the main issue is here is don't refer, don't treat, just watch this. Now that is different from true disease. About 20% of folks who take amiodarone get true hypothyroidism. That's amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism. And a lesser percent get hyperthyroidism, which is really complicated and difficult to treat. That is definitely an endocrinology referral, and we see a lot of this still. Um, there's a couple of different varieties, and they can take a long time to treat and differentiate. All right, so the summary for having a TSH that's high and the T4 also going in the same direction, the most common cause is recent compliance with therapy. The other common cause is certain drugs like amiodarone. I didn't mention TSH resistance because I don't think you'll encounter it very much, but it is out there. There are certain families. There's families in the Chicago area. There's some in Europe, some in Canada, and probably more and more we're going to be recognizing polymorphisms of people who truly are, quote, TSH resistant. Um, I mean, so that should say thyroid hormone resistance. I'm sorry, not TSH resistant. Thyroid hormone resistance uh, means that thyroid hormone can act appropriately in certain tissues and maybe not in other tissues. Um, a lot of patients may be asking about this because it's on the internet. Just know that it's extremely rare to find true thyroid hormone resistance. If you think they have it, you check family members and they have the same pattern, and that's kind of a helpful thing. And they're hard to treat because you don't try to give them enough thyroid hormone to bring their TSH down or they'll become thyrotoxic. And then central hyperthyroidism is really rare. Almost nobody has a TSH secreting pituitary adenoma. I've seen one case in 16 years. Um, our pituitary specialists have seen more. So if you have this pattern, at least you have to think about it. And maybe if you can't find any of this other stuff, maybe you will send them for an MRI. But it's very rare. All right, so case six. We now have a pregnant woman who was 16 weeks, about four months along. She's referred to you because her TSH is 1.9, which is normal but a full panel was checked and she has a high total T4. So the reason they check labs is because she was losing more weight than they thought she should in the first trimester. They were actually looking for hyperthyroidism, but her TSH wasn't abnormal. So I think we've already gone over this a couple of times. This is just estrogen effect. This is every pregnant woman, okay? I never get this from family docs or internal medicine docs. I get this a lot from OBGYNs, I guess, because they're checking the whole panel and they're not aware of this effect. All right, high estrogen states we also already mentioned. So other than pregnant women, it's people on OCPs. So just don't check the total T4 or if you do know why it's high. So this is a 42-year-old gentleman who has longstanding type 2 diabetes complicated by retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy. And unfortunately, his nephropathy is such that he has macroscopic proteinuria. Um, he has 2-plus lower extremity edema from this protein loss. CKD, I mean, he doesn't have um, low EGFR yet. He has a persistently low T4 and T3, despite a normal TSH. 
So I hear he's wasting TBG in his protein urine, and that's exactly it. It's just the exact opposite of people who are making too much TBG. He's losing TBG, so his total is low. His body is auto-compensated um, by, by adjusting the binding component, so his free T4 and free T3 will still be fine, which is why his TSH is okay. So he's completely euthyroid. Okay, so the abnormal total T4 and T3 alone is pretty easy. There's really nothing that causes that besides a TBG problem. Okay, so if your TSH is fine, your free hormones are fine, you just have this total hormone that's out of whack, it's either they're making too much or losing too much of it. There are some congenital forms. I have a couple of families in my practice, and they don't need to be treated, um, but you see a bunch of folks in the same family who all have a slightly high total T4 or slightly low total T4 and everything else is fine. You can measure TBG, it's really easy to do. In a couple of days lab, we'll get it back to you, or you can just say that's probably what they have. Question. So the question is, even if you do the sensitive TSH, say that again? Does it still mean that it's TBG related? Or? Does it still mean it's TBG related? If the TSH is completely normal and the total T4 is high or low, then it's definitely a TBG problem. Yes. Okay. So last two cases. A 59-year-old woman with a history of coronary disease and congestive heart failure comes in for an elective orthopedic procedure. She does well. She's about to go home. Um, after a short stay, but then she complains of some palpitations. Nothing severe, but the team's worried because they know about the possibility of contrast-related hyperthyroidism, so they, check, so they check TFTs. And in fact, her free T4 is high. It's 2.6, but her total T4 is not high, and her TSH isn't low. And I will tell you, with iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, the thyroid hormones are high, and the TSH, even in a short period of time, will go down. So. Does she actually have hyperthyroidism? So here's, I see some maybe no, maybe yes. Hard to know for sure unless you're at the bedside and evaluating the patient. Um, but this pattern is really common in hospitalized patients who have been given prophylaxis against DVT. Um, so heparin and low molecular weight heparin cause increased dissociation of thyroid hormone from TBG. It's just a test tube thing, really. So you'll get a really high free T4, but they're normal. And that's actually what was going on with this patient. So something to be aware of if you're checking TFTs in the hospital. All right, and then final case is a two centimeter left nodule um, palpated in a young pregnant woman who was in her third trimester of pregnancy, 32 weeks of gestation. Her TSH is normal. That's the first step, by the way, when you palpate a nodule, you check a TSH first. But her free T4 was also checked, and it happens to be a little bit low. And you say, hmm, we've talked about TBG causing high T4s in pregnancy. Why is this lady's free T4 low? I thought it was supposed to be normal. Um, migraines have been getting a little bit worse in her second and third trimester. She's had migraines forever. It's nothing new. Her OB is now concerned, well, could she have a pituitary tumor? Because her headaches are getting worse, and she's got this low T4. Her visual fields are fine in the office. Her reflexes are normal. She has plenty of prolactin, which you should have when you're pregnant. So there's no real indication she has a pituitary problem by visual fields or prolactin measurement. So the question to me that was posed was, does she need a pituitary MRI? <coughs> and I do get this consult from OB a good bit now, especially with these free T4 measurements. So the answer is no. Um, so just like total T4 is often elevated throughout pregnancy because of TBG effect, free T4, interestingly enough, for reasons that are difficult to explain, does typically fall as pregnancy progresses. It's not a physiologic issue, meaning there's plenty of thyroid hormone around for the mom and the baby. Um, but free T4 measurements do fall, especially if you're using a regular commercial lab that does direct free T4 assays. It's different if you're using fancy equilibrium dialysis assays, which most of us aren't using in everyday use. So here's pregnancy. In the first trimester, you get a lot of HCG, as you should. Um, that actually drives the TSH down a little bit. You get a lot of TBG throughout pregnancy that makes your T4 high, but the free T4 as you move along in pregnancy, by the time you're in your second and third trimester, unless your lab is reporting trimester-specific ranges, which ours finally is, um, but usually they'll just have TSH and free T4, and they don't care if your patient is pregnant or in first, second, or third trimester, and they should. Um, I've listed the ranges there for you. Um, so in third trimester, be careful. If you have a normal-looking pregnant lady who just has a low free T4, it's probably a lab effect. Thank you.
All right, so there's my summary for whenever your free hormones are abnormal, meaning TSH is fine, total may or may not be fine. But if you have a high free T4 or free T3 alone, think about things that increase your dissociation of TBG from thyroid hormone. We mentioned heparin, but furosemide can do this, and so can salicylate. So I get a lot of calls from the heart failure clinic, which happens to be three floors down from mine, about T4s that they're finding that are sky high. Um, they're in the twos and threes. Sometimes with mildly high TBG excess states, they can spill over and make your free T4 abnormal. And then the opposite for low free T4 and T3 alone, some of the antiepileptics can do it, as can the third trimester of pregnancy. All right, so the summary is a little wordy, so I've just highlighted for you the things I think are the most important things, which is to rely on your TSH, avoid testing hospitalized patients. These are kind of the three patterns of abnormal TFTs we went through in the second half of the talk. And this is a reference table if you like reference tables. Um, it just goes over all the way, different patterns you can find and what the main differential should be for those patterns.